Hello everyone, today we introduce the ethnic uh, composition of uh, early 20th century Galicia, mostly in the broader Ukrainian struggle for independence. Uh, so in, in a very tormented time of the uh, local history, we're talking roughly from the beginning of the first to the beginning of the second war wars. And uh, therefore, a moment of, of dramatic, uh, if anything, mostly political re, mm, uh, re reorganization of, of the region and of an increased nationalistic push, drive, and in fact, the, the end of an order that, especially in Central Eastern Europe, as you know, uh, up to the end of World War the First, fundamentally had been in the hands of um, three empires that as such ended, right? The, the Second Reich, the, um, the Habsburgic Empire, and the Russian Empire. That had, of course, been the most uh, reactionary countries in Europe to the, uh, let's say, to, to the efforts of the those ethnicities that had sought for national independence. And this is understandable for, for many reasons that anybody will, you know, who knows contemporary history has an idea of right, you know, why these countries had remained like this and what played what role they had played after the restoration and in which terms, by the way, they were among each other, that were surely not uh, flattery. As you know, the, uh, the this broader issues were uh, part of the same causes uh, of World War the First in an ethnic sense. I mean, think about, I don't know, the Balkans and so the connections even with this broader Slavic, Pan-Slavic um, instances of independence and so on. I don't know, I, as you know, I am, a, I am a medievalist, but if we, like, if you want me to talk more about contemporary history, you can do it. This video is about Ukraine are naturally connected to 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 the current events, but they they are, I realized that you know they are a bit in depth in, in Ukraine. We never even talked about what what was going on all around, and and in these specific videos we will not even properly do it. But if you're interested, I can cover that. I'm planning also to make something about the Soviet Union and so on. So to to explain a bunch of things that I deem to be useful and important. In any case, um, when we look at, so in the previous videos we've looked at Galicia within the Habsburgic Empire and we have observed all those political, institutional and social mechanisms for which Ukrainians fundamentally came to define a modern national identity within this frame, always looking at uh, at, at the East, the Russian Empire, where lots of Ukrainians, as a matter of fact, in Galicia, there were millions of Ukrainians. In in the Tsarist Empire, there were tens of millions, right? So the, the whole purpose, as we will see now, was to, of course, uh, reconnect them in, in a unitary uh, effort. And what is fascinating, in fact, about Ukraine is that uh, it had at this point a much greater chance of success uh, than Lithuania, for example, within the Russian Empire. Mm -hmm. The Ukrainians were, in fact, tens of millions. The Lithuanians were fundamentally two millions. So even just the, the sheer numbers mean a lot here. And more, uh, unlike the Lithuanians in the Russian Empire, Ukrainians in Habsburgic Galicia voted in parliamentary elections. Right, there was a, a completely different culture, of course, within you know the, the Austrian and the Russian Empire, respectively. So that Ukrainians had learned in Galicia to form legal political associations, to publish legally in their own Ukrainian language that, as we've seen, was becoming prevalent, even where, you know, were strong, let's say, powerful uh, 
uh, cultural minorities, such as the Polish one that had somewhat also just stated the same uh, rise of Ukrainian activism and, uh, you know, proper literary culture and so on. And we'll see it better now. And more as Ukrainians were seeking for the universal male suffrage and they were bringing the struggle properly in the among the mass right as we've seen ukraine was being built differently from many other nationalities uh, at, at the time in the struggle for independence not much on the base of a tradition of the continuity of of an elite but on the concept of ethnicity proper because the strength of ukrainians in the societies where they lived was the peasantry in a much lar- by a much larger scale than other say central european countries that had a, gr- a, a different segmentation where they were most stratified was a stronger middle class like properly an ethnic elite ukrainians instead had uh, had been building their own elite by this point but still in fact the the main problem within these repartitions were that they were often fact living next to substantial minorities that were also connected to the struggle for independence of other countries, chiefly Poland, right, that at the end of the f- World War the First was recreated and was thinking in fact of re- repristinating the uh, older Commonwealth border, at least as far as the Polish Kingdom uh, well, of course, also Lithuania at that point we was concerned. We made a video about the Polish Bolshevik War, by the way, and we, we addressed something about that. We will come back on it more in detail, also from the Ukrainian perspective. Mm-hmm. So this ethnic dimension was particularly important because it allowed the Ukrainians in Galicia to oust the Polish gentry from the traditional leading role. And as we've seen, also the secular and ecclesiastical effort was combined in Ukraine. That's and, and more than that, we've seen how nationalists and socialists worked together. In other countries, it wasn't quite the same thing. Uh, of course, there was an overlapping in, in the case of properly seeking uh, independence per se, but in in the, in Ukraine, things were much more interesting, especially in Galicia, were much more interesting uh, along this pattern. The Greek Catholic Church, from essentially a, a symbol of the uh, Commonwealth unification of Western Eastern churches from a uh, Roman Catholic position of dominance, had uh, Greek Catholic was the name that it acquired in the former lands of the Commonwealth within the Habsburgic Empire properly given by the Austrians, um, had transformed itself instead in properly a Ukrainian church, right? Uh, In a national institutions, per se, that was, from the ecclesiastical side, leading the the struggle for independence. And thus, um, this brought also for political and military events that I think you know, the the Galician offensive uh, of the Russians, as important Habsburgic defeat uh, in the region brought um, the Austrians uh, while fighting with with Russia to start persecuting Galicians as you know be regarding them fundamentally as pro-Russians and this, the, the thing is not really as we've seen like that because um, first of all Ukrainians of course didn't like uh, any foreign domina- domination for that matter. Uh, They thought uh, to have, and it was actually correct, acculturated the Russians to have contributed to create properly modern Russia as we know it, which is also true. We we have seen it in the uh, some of the previous videos. It's something that is is a big deal, culturally speaking, in history. And surely not common to hear, but it's fundamentally what historiography assesses without much of a doubt, but also the Habsburgic repression um, indirectly helped further Ukrainian national compaction, because um, it doesn't matter whether you were pro or against it, but in the moment which you identified 
such uh, such group, you you would fundamentally define it in a way or another, and so give it a consistency also internationally that was uh, uh, was surely relevant even in, in in the much greater and chaotic and gigantic uh, drama of, of World War the First, where lots of things in fact were being uh, also worsened in uh, properly generated in a negative sense uh, especially in the, the inter-ethnic uh, competition if not properly fight and um, the Galician Ukrainian politicians in Vienna naturally had favored the establishment of an independent Ukraine which didn't entail just Galicia, but of course lands within the same Tsarist Empire. Mm -hmm. And this had been done chiefly by Ukrainizing, let's say, Eastern Galicia, that was in fact fundamentally the area where Ukrainians were the, the wide majority as opposed to the West where the majority was Polish. And um, in independence seemed feasible uh, immediately after the February Revolution in Russia right? and especially the proclamation of the Ukrainian National Republic in Kiev in early 1917. Right, so again, today we will not talk about this, we will not talk about the, the Red Repression, all this, we will see it all in another video, but bear it in mind that the situation was pretty dramatic. Uh, for everybody at that point. Um, Galician Ukrainians also were quite serious about uh, the Wilsonian uh, point, right, about self-determination after that the United States had entered World War I uh, in April 1917 and uh, eventually would take, of course, a position against the communists in Russia. So there was some cause for optimism or at least having a positive outlook regarding the possibility of the mm, not just the establishment of that which at that point had already occurred but properly the consolidation and affirmation of Ukrainian independence. But of course uh, in, in war everything is unpredictable and so also in politics international politics even more for that matter. So one main problem however will this stemmed from the fact that as we've seen um, the um, let's say talking about Galicia again the country was not ethnically homogeneous right and 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 it wasn't from a cultural linguistical and social point of view. As we've seen Ukrainians were mainly a peasant force mainly. Uh, and as such, the countryside, as you know, is very different from the city. The most important city in, in Galicia, in eastern Galicia, as we've seen, was Lviv. That was obviously seen by Galician Ukrainians as their, their capital, their would-be capital. But, historically, as we've seen, Lviv was essentially a Polish city. Lvov, that um, was such historically by tradition um, the the majority of the inhabitants would have properly considered themselves Poles. We have seen how this divide we are approximate like we don't have to think about uh, a crystallized concept of nationality but properly the truest one, the political and cultural one. That is many of these people were of Ukrainian descent or even of, of other descent for that matter other than Polish right but they consider themselves as such because Lviv uh, had been historically uh, a Polish city for centuries uh, the the intelligentsia the, the elite etc was Polish or Polonized anyhow uh, and therefore in a, in a what, what is meaningful here also from a religious point of view is that this 52 percent um, also equated to a Roman Catholic quota, right, in the Austrian census of 1900. That's how these 
these people were considering themselves Roman Catholic, which was different from uh, the Greek um, Catholics. Um, in fact, there were probably more more of, of uh, Greek Catholic Poles than Roman Catholic Ukrainians in the same city. Mm -hmm. Also, aside from this ethnic, uh, you know, declaration, more than three fourths than uh, uh, Lvov's inhabitants claimed Polish as their mother tongue, mm -hmm. which, however, it's further complicated by the fact that this census didn't. Uh, contemplate the Yiddish speaking Jews that lived in the city that were an important uh, an important minority also um, uh, Lvov was um, like was the only um, s seat of of a mm, Polish speaking diet on the lands of the old Commonwealth. So this was seen by the Poles also elsewhere as an important symbol of Polish culture and actually of its uh, triumph over the centuries in a land that was not, you know, the properly the center of historic Poland, but still was considered uh, Polish and had remained even with the evident presence of other of other people, not just in the city, but in in the in the countryside, that was not prevalently Polish. Um, and the the whole educational system and public life fundamentally was was Polish at that point. But th there had been an important German influence as well. But by the time we're talking uh, about now, uh, Polish was obviously the the lang the the elective language of culture. And World War I changed a lot of things because, as you know, it was a quite traumatic uh, war uh, as far as all these um, centuries-old cultural sedimentations and balance ha were concerned. Uh, these were essentially ancien regime realities, properly from a mental point of view, in terms of political culture, etc. Um, World War, post World War the first projected dramatically into a uh, nationalist statalist reality f for which uh, the the various nations began to, to consider their their statehood in function of a absolute homogeneity on essentially ethnic linguistic religious ground and the poles knew that if the austro-hungarian empire had collapsed as it happened at the end of the war. Yes, Lvov was Polish, but the the surrounding, I mean, the country, Galicia, Eastern Galicia, was Ukrainian. And so, in a way or another, from a demographic point of view, they would have found themselves hopelessly outnumbered. Mm -hmm. Two-thirds of the population in the region was Greek Catholic, religiously speaking, also, in the 44 administrative divisions of Eastern Galicia, Poles were a majority only in Lvov, in the one of the city of, of Lvov itself. So, the Polish interest in, in Lvov in, in, in Galicia was, was of course, uh, grounded in the belief that Polish culture I, uh, back in the day, in the times of, of the Polish Kingdom, of the Commonwealth, and uh, where properly Lvov was, was part of, uh, properly of the Polish Kingdom, uh, the Poles had brought civilization, right? And, and the continuity of Polish culture in the city was a proof of the superiority of Polish culture over the local Ukrainians. In fact, uh, when uh, Poland acquired independence in 1918, um, it was uh, clear from a Polish national standpoint that uh, Lvov was more of a Polish city traditionally than Vilno slash Vilnius in Lithuania was. And, and this, this is fair in the measure in which, of course, uh, Lithuania uh, had 
had a an important status within the Commonwealth in parallel with Poland. So uh, everybody kind of recognized the, the Lithuanian uh, identity in, in the historical memory of the Commonwealth. Whereas Ukrainians, as we've seen, fundamentally had never had uh, a representation. There was no such thing like a Polish-Lithuanian-Ukrainian Commonwealth. I made a video to explain how uh, there was actually a possibility uh, and a mischance. We probably would have brought the Commonwealth to even supersede Russia in power and um, and that failed instead because the the dialogue between Polish and Ukrainians kind of failed the negotiations not much because of a reciprocal antipathy but simply because of certain internal mechanisms that that we have seen um, that uh, were also understandable at the time by best by some by some degree but history could have really gone a different way so um, what was what, uh, Lviv, Lvov? Well, in Galicia, well, it had been founded by Orthodox, uh, Orthodox princes of the Rus back in the day. Um, it was a relatively recent city. The foundation was traditionally 1264. But, I mean, compared at least to, I don't know, Kiev or other uh, centers of the Rus, 1264 was well after the Mongol invasions, so a, a different time from the, uh, the, the, the preeminence of the Kievan Rus. But indeed, uh, from, from the Middle Ages, the mid-14th century, until the Polish partitions of the end of the 18th, uh, Lvov had been part of the Polish Kingdom was part, as we've seen, of the Rus Palatinate, so also some areas were, at, at that point, more more culturally advanced had contributed together with Kiev, as we were explaining in the uh, in previous videos, factually to 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 acculturate the Moscovy to open it to to other languages and culture and and Western civilization and so on. True Polish culture, by the way, that at that point had become talking about the 16th, the 17th century, had become in fact dominant and uh, was fact more more advanced than, than the same Ukrainian one at that point um, and of course after the partition of Poland lots of things had changed because the Habsburgic rule had brought uh, as you know also as in other areas of Poland to radical transformations Lviv had passed in these centuries from I mean we're talking barely of more than one century from 20,000 to 140,000 inhabitants, right? Th this happened fast, like uh, regions of the previous Polish kingdom. Even Warsaw under the Russians de decuplicated its populace in a few generations in the 19th century. Um, and um, what is what is important still, though, again, as we've seen, that Wob had maintained, in spite of this change, still a Polish elite and culture. So it had survived also. Uh, such brutal mm, change that modernity had brought. And the Austrians, as we have seen, had favored mm, Polish, the Polish elite in, in Galicia, historically. We have seen in the previous videos how Ukrainians worked to, in fact, emerge, and also imitating the St. Pauls and negotiating with the Habsburgs in that direction. And the same Poles, in part, had leaned towards the same uh, instances of Ukrainian independence because, uh, let's say, stressing that in within the uh, within as Habsburgic Galicia would have meant would have put a greater leverage for the opportunities of that land that the Poles, as a broader people across the border uh, between also I I within Prussia and, and Russia, um, had to. To in fact reenact uh, Galicia altogether by undermining the, 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 the Austrian government there. And so the Poles had all their ideas about this, how they, they thought that Roman Catholicism had brought civilization to Eastern Galicia and all these things. And the Poles were quite, um, quite secure with this. Like, if you study the history of Poland in, after 1918, right, I'm a great. Mm, you know, I love Polish history. I've had a lot of. Um, I wish I knew it much better for that matter, but I've, uh, I've, got, uh, I've had a, 
an important guide uh, and uh, you know an interest in, in the land and, and sympathetic to the broader to the broader cause but of course we're talking about realities that have been ferociously oppressed for 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 centuries and now we're breaking free in ways that were tri triumphalistic and also successful right look at the polish bolshevik war and what the the poles also with the su with the support of ukrainians were able to do against the uh, the red army but uh, aside from a few enlightened figures such as um stanislav Grabsky, we imagine a sort of negotiation for for Galicia because they understood that Russia was powerful. Anyway, and especially uh, Josef Pilsudski, who, in fact, as we were just saying, used um, Ukraine in, uh, as an ally against against the Bolsheviks. The rest of Polish politicians were fundamentally uncompromising with Lvov as also with other realities fundamentally as Poland managed to indicate basically any ethnicity that sur surrounded them in a way uh, in the interwar period so also to, to dramatically pay tragically and horrifying the paying for the price starting from 1939 and so this must be understood also from the Polish side but it also from the side of this these other peoples, these minorities. And in April 1919, uh, the Polish Constituent Assembly unanimously decreed that uh, Galicia had to be annexed to Poland entirely. Also, as we were saying before, there was the Jewish question, because um, the Jews, not the Ukrainians, were Lvov's most visible minority. Mm. This is quite relevant, right? Consider that the Jews in areas like, um, like in fact, speaking of modern Ukraine, uh, Western Russia, etc., were consistent, right? They were consistent in Poland as well, as you know. It, it, there was a, a tradition, in fact, of the the same uh, the same Commonwealth, right? That for centuries had. Uh, s become basically the the cradle of Euro the European Jewry by tradition. Uh, the mm, the Jews uh, sp today we're talking about Galicia, so but this can extend to, to other regions of the of the Commonwealth had uh, prospered this land um, since the Renaissance and before. They were instrumental to the efforts of the Polish crown to centralize power that eventually would fail and would bring to the disaster of the, the Polish uh, vassalage to Russian and partition, etc. So uh, Jews had always been, since the Middle Ages, an important presence in, in, in Central and Eastern Europe. They had always been vexated by a way, you know, a great part of this 19th century, or even 20th century for that matter. Eastern European culture was literally the the the, the anti-Jewish pogroms, right? So, what what do you do to go out there, go find you go kill the Jews, right? That there is all a, uh, an, an enormous and um, you know, in fact, pretty unknown uh, literature and cultural production. Think about even the uh, the corpse bride is um, connected to these horrifying massacres of the Jewry um, in those lands. So. Um, the okay we, we know what we're talking about and they the but however that there was in spite of the persecutions and the the, the oppression etc there, there was still a, a co in some parts a, a peaceful coexistence it, it wasn't true everywhere but if, even if you listen to stories from holocaust survivors etc you you understand that this thing could vary, right, from from areas where, like, I don't know, Poznan was the center, the, the capital of anti-Semitism, where Jews were properly treated, like, like in a horrifying way, to, to places where Jews were, it's not much because just we're the majority somewhere, but even elsewhere, were treated, you know, as, not as peers, traditionally, but still, you know, civilly, um, until the 
18th century. In fact, uh, the Galician Jews, uh, in part, uh, specifically, preserved a communal life according to their privileges that had been granted them in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Um, in uh, under the Habsburgs, instead, after the partition of Poland, they uh, were mostly assimilated to, like, within German culture, right? So. Um, the Jews, for example, formed uh, much of the middle class and also the professional elite of, um, of Lvov, that in uh, Yiddish was known as Lemberich, which in fact is, uh, you know, Yiddish is, is, is German in, you know, the, the, in German it's Lemberg, right? So that was their, their side, right? They, they mostly came at that point from, from the German side of the aisle, culturally speaking. Also, much of the small working class was Jewish in the city. After Galicia gained autonomy uh, in 1867 with the, you can say, the split, uh, with the, the creation probably of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Habsburgic government uh, compromised with mostly the Polish elite that, as we've seen, ruled Galicia, bringing the, the Jews consequently to shift, let's say, to... to to be passed properly from the Germanic side to the Polish one, right? And uh, in fact, in in the Habsburgic schools at that point, Jews learned Polish, and things, as you know, went uh, downhill for the Habsburgic Empire and its traditional uh, liberality. There was. Uh, uh, ethno-nationalization of the political struggles in Austria it was traditional instead federalist instead it kind of began to, to buy with the massification of culture into the pan -Ger germanism and all these things in 1873 there was uh, the financial crash that uh, brought together with it the uh, the, the worst the resurgence of the worst uh, of anti-semitic uh, property of Judenhaus um, and uh, and so the worsening of the Jewish living conditions in the land. And there was naturally a necessity from the Jewish side at that point to cooperate politically with a given group. So the Galician Jews joined the Polish club in the parliament and also ran as its candidates. Um, at the end of the century, however, things changed further because as Ukrainian nationalism took over, fundamentally, or over the, the, probably the, the, the Polish elite, the secular Jews were drawn in, like from, from the Ukrainian side. And this was obvious because at that point uh, it, it was evident that the, the empire was in crisis and so that the next rulers of what whatever would have emerged from it, um, from its ashes, would have, uh, you know, would have been in charge. So, the uh, Jewish nationalists, the Zionists, mm, agreed at that point to to side electorally with Ukrainians in 1907. And this was important because in the meanwhile, universal male suffrage was introduced. Uh, there was uh, naturally a Jewish involvement in the national policy of the land. And, uh, and so it's obvious that the Jews were, were trying to be faithful to whatever w would have been the, the prevalent national uh, group right, uh, that would have emerged f uh, from, from the Habsburgic collapse. And in any case, they perfectly knew that whatever group would have been at the top, life would have been very worse for them. And we will see how, in fact, true this was. And the Jews at this point couldn't even hope for anything else, because as you know, you know the prospect for, for a Jewish state in Europe basically did not exist. Uh, Hebrew remained the sacred language, Many Jews didn't, 
didn't really understand that you know Yiddish was used normally as the normal tongue. Um, Polish and German was usually known because uh, if anything for commerce etc. Um, and after the constitution of 1867 uh, Galician Jews enjoyed equal rights could consider themselves uh, Austrians even right uh, independently from like what 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 was their their prevalent uh, cultural background either Polish or German and yet they knew that such um, such background would have not been enough for gaining in, in further um, liberties let's say in a in a future state mm -hmm. uh, there was an important uh, shift as we were saying before by the 20s of the 19th century the local Jews essentially were part of German culture and they they would still essentially express themselves in Yiddish in fact um, in uh, the 18th uh, I mean publicly speaking I mean in uh, the 1870s Jews were mm, you know advocating for their integration in Polish policy but arguing in German which in the area especially in Western Galicia you know it was an important German influence in culture and next to the Polish one by the 90s of the 19th century the Zionists wrote and spoke Polish in Galicia but the second generation of Zionists at the beginning of the 20th century came back to use Yiddish as a language of policy. They were normally fluent in Polish, German, Yiddish, um, but they understood that uh, none of them could have, none of these languages could have made them achieve any, any actual Statal identity you know, at, at a local level. The the point of Zionism there was having uh, essentially a, uh, of course, a state on their own. At some point, where Hebrew would have been the daily language, mm -hmm. and there was an active effort of of the Jews that were perhaps 13% in the population of Eastern Galicia as a whole at the beginning of the 20th century and in majority uh, and a majority in towns to uh, to work out their situation that seemed at that point in the absence of a of an actual work to create a, a, a Jewish state in Palestine to work out their their life as better as they could in a diaspora state right uh, that is recognizing the turmoil that the first world war and uh, ethno-nationalism had and statalism had unleashed and trying therefore to you know for hoping for, for for the best to happen why right? things uh, would ha wouldn't actually go that way um, and the the main hope, uh, the, the at least the most the realistic one, that um, a Jew of uh, Lemberg, Lemberg, uh, Lviv, Lvov, could um, hope for was to essentially just maintain the status that they had uh, enjoyed in previous times, which was in fact a pious illusion, uh, given the new climate. And uh, after all, you know that they would have contented themselves with that, but we will see again how things went later. For today, we stop here. I uh, just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming content. I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.